Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, this is panel I1, um, titled, let me just pull it up, Interdisciplinary Responses to Decolonial Thinking. Um, the moderator actually is uh, Dr. Daniel Yo, but he was here since 1230. <laughs> and just before we started, <clears throat> he got cut off. Uh, I hope he, will, he can be readmitted uh, soon. But um, we can begin with our first presentation. Um, by the way, the, the, this panel is a submitted panel uh, by the team from La Trobe University. So thank you very much uh, to our presenters for submitting this panel. <clears throat> the first paper is titled Recapping, Remapping Research, Decolonial Reflections on Knowledge, Space, and Dialogue to be presented by Andrew T. and Anna Torres Ablett. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, Anna, can you share your screen, please? Sorry, hold on. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Andrew T, and I am presenting this paper with my colleague, Anna Torres Ablett. Entitled Recapping, Remapping Research, um, we hope to share our experiences in the decolonizing practices of knowledge, space, and dialogue. Next slide, please. I will be speaking about conceptualizing interdisciplinary spaces, and Anna will then discuss our experiences of encountering disparity in decolonial discourse. Next slide, please. And next slide. So Remapping Research Beyond Colonial Knowledge Formations was a seminar series which we collectively organized as part of a team of Filipino PhD candidates enrolled in an Australian university in 2021. Three of the five members of the team will be presenting later in this panel, and Anna and I have taken on the task of delivering this initial reflexive exercise on the process and experience of conceptualizing and implementing this seminar series. In doing so, in telling you about our experiences, we attempt to identify relevant nuances and the implications of these to the broader project of intellectual decolonization. Um, next slide, please. So the five team members are Anna, Majo, Francis, Nikos, and myself. Anna, Majo, and Francis are all from the Department of Social Inquiry at La Trobe University, an office that is large enough to cover a diversity of research topics. These range from Anna's investigations into migrants and disasters, Majo's explorations of nationalism and economic development, and Francis's comparative studies of constitution making in Indonesia and the Philippines. Nikos is from the Australian Research Center in Sex, Health, and Society, where he studies the risk environment inhabited and the pleasures experienced by migrant gay sex workers in Thailand. And I am in screen studies, working on audiovisual musicality, intermedial performance, and pop cosmopolitanism in the songs of South Korean pop group BTS. Despite three of the five scholars in this seminar series belonging to the same department, the specialized research topics expected in postgraduate studies produce an interdisciplinary mix. This required us to agree upon an idea for the seminar series that was expansive enough to cover our specific interests. When Anna initially approached the four of us by declaring her interest in decolonizing methodologies, we were all willing to engage with that since it was an idea that we had all independently encountered in different contexts here and there. Next slide, please. However, 
two weeks into the discussions, which we held through email and Zoom meetings, Anna realized that we needed to broaden the scope of our seminar series so that we could include decolonization alongside other distinct yet related concepts like postcolonialism, orientalism, feminism, cosmopolitanism, etc. Working then from a shared sense of colonialism and research led us to reflect and discuss about how knowledge work often thrives upon um, built uh, upon existing inequalities. At its most abstract, this relates to the assumed superiority and agency of the scholar who is the active knowing subject looking into passive objects of study. In the human sciences, which includes anthropology and so many other disciplines, including our own disciplines, the fact that the objects of our knowledge work are other persons transforms this philosophical issue into something that may cause actual harm, whether unintentional or not. In addition, once we latch onto what differentiates persons in social settings, markers of identity like sex, gender, race, and class, then we realize that these persons and the harms that they undergo are concrete um, issues. These are not simply theoretical questions. Next slide, please. So why entitle it Remapping Research? As the resident humanities researcher in our group, I found myself drawn to a metaphor that could help us articulate how knowledge work conventionally happens. Given our interest in the relational distance between researchers and who they are researching, a distance that encompasses vast gulfs of difference, we found a figure for knowledge work that favored the spatial. The traces of the encounters between knower and known that happen during any kind of research project lends itself quite well to the figure of maps if maps are seen as representations of space and the relationship between those, uh, those elements that inhabit that space. This is not a new idea. This is not a new metaphor. Even in our most colloquial, when we scholars and researchers speak about our work, we speak about topics, we speak about fields of study, the areas we are exploring, the positions we are taking and making. Gadget students like ourselves often engage with the persistent imperative to make a quote-unquote original contribution to knowledge, a goal that is strongly associated with visions of venturing to uncharted lands where we may stake our claims and establish ownership of whatever we discuss in these epistemic territories. The scholar-researcher as a great explorer is a romantic and dashing figure, but like its real-life historical counterparts, it possesses rather trouble, troubling associations. The quest for knowledge in the scholarly drive to question is not only um, etymologically related to conquest, but our practices themselves, if we consider the discursive action that research and scholarship is, these do not contradict these etymological roots. Instead, they bring them to life. Um, next slide, please. So remapping research is a way of reimagining or re-imaging research. Um, next slide, please. My proposal to think metaphorically about all of this emerged from my own initial readings into the work of George Lakoff and Mark Johnson. I find the development of the ideas of these two philosophers from um, uh, their 1980 book, Metaphors We Live By, to 1999's Philosophy in the Flesh, The Embodied Mind and Its Challenge to Western Thought, I find these ideas and the development of these ideas provocative. Both Lakoff and Johnson engage with how persons use conceptual metaphors to make sense of the world, how the cognitive processes of sense-making do not then take place in realms of pure rationality, but actually involve the entire sensorium of the human body. And their idea, their figure of the embodied mind is useful because it can challenge dominant paradigms and dominant conventions of knowledge formation. I believe this also connects with the embodied imagination associated with the literature on those epistemic territories that I mentioned earlier. Now, with all of these ideas, with all of these figures and metaphors in our heads, the five of us felt that the conversations we hope to initiate in this seminar series can cut across both the particulars of our individual research interests and also the vocabularies of decolonization and its associated concepts. We felt that we could do this through a process of decentering the privileged position of the scholar in relation to their chosen spaces, and most importantly, to the others who inhabit those spaces. In reconfiguring new relationships to the lands where we are and to those where we desire to go, remapping research seems an urgent task. 
if knowledge work is necessarily disruptive because it is a kind of labor that produces results in the world, that creates ideas and generates concepts, perhaps scholars should not be so privileged that they remain that they themselves remain untouched by their actions, especially when the world where they are is changed in ways big and small by the work that we do. Perhaps this is how the epistemological and the ethical reveal themselves to be not isolated phenomena, but intricately related with one another. And in many ways, these relationships, and this time I'm thinking about the relationships between persons and community and communities of scholars, I think it also played a big role once the seminar series that we were organizing actually started. Anna will now discuss these. You are muted. Yes, I realized that. Uh, I just said thank you, Andrew. And I'm, I'll continue with Andrew's reflections here by sharing some aspects of encounters that caused our team to reflect on our assumptions about decolonization. So by using collective and personal experience as empirical examples, we are aligning with um, reflexivity and positionality as practiced by feminist geographic scholars. So let me begin by providing more detail on the setting in which these encounters happened. As Andrew mentioned, we envisioned this seminar series to be rolled out in six parts throughout the year. The first seminar launched the overall theme using as a starting point an article by Dr. Leon Musavi entitled The Decolonial Bandwagon. In this article, he warns of the dangers of intellectual uh, decolonization becoming a hype unless approached with a conscious attempt to overcome practices that may reinscribe coloniality. So inspired by these, each of us then took turns to lead one seminar each, exploring iterations of colonial knowledge formation in our different areas of interest. The resulting topics and themes are shown in the flyers, and our main audience was other higher degree by research students, or HDRs, in the departments uh, which we were members of. So there you see the six um, flyers. So hindi ko na masyadong ide-detalye yung content. This content is documented elsewhere. And as Andrew said, the three of our colleagues are going to elaborate on some of these later on in the panel. But um, I'll focus more on the encounters, just a couple of them. So having succeeded in merging our five diverse perspectives of colonialism and research, we thought we were prepared to engage with a wider circle of our academic community with our message of remapping research. Our, however, not too long after our proposal was accepted for implementation, we had our first challenge when we learned that another PhD team was also planning a seminar series on decolonized research. So we organized a dialogue with them to resolve the overlap. But we found out that there was actually not much overlap because their focus was very different. It was heavily leaning towards redressing the impact of British settler colonization on Australian Aboriginal people. Although they're equally passionate about the colonization, they were looking at it from a different perspective that was um, not in a range of themes. This was our first awareness of the relevance of positionality in different interpretations of advocating for decolonization. Subsequent comments from persons of similar background to them, uh, i.e., white Australian-based scholars seem to echo the same perspective of looking at the colonization as consciousness raising with an eye towards correcting the wrongs of Australia's colonial past. The effect of this encounter with positionality was for us to then be more aware of our differentiated place as transnational scholars from a country that has been colonized. The second aspect of disparity that I will share here relates to how we navigated the process of selecting discussants. So each discussion leader was to bring in one or two key reactors who would share their thoughts on the main presentation before we involved um, the wider audience in the discussion. Although each of us had the freedom to choose who we, who we might want to bring in as reactors to our respective topics, there seemed to be an informal criteria that the discussion would be better served if we selected someone from a common background. All of us gravitated towards scholars with whom we had identified common denominators. Thus, regions like Latin America, Southeast Asia, Africa, the Pacific, and of course the Philippines were represented in person or in, re in research materials that we cited. 
On an intellectual level, the results were satisfactory. Each reactor had their unique contribution, but ultimately reson resonated with the group's context of decolonization. On the level of relationships, however, it was interesting to note how nuances of identity came into play in the process of negotiating with prospective reactors. This included intersecting characteristics such as political orientation, academic status, education, previous experiences with exclusion and racism. Even when personal friendships were a factor, the negotiations were not all that straightforward. What this tells us is, is that we cannot assume solidarity on the basis of superficial decolonial commonalities, let alone sweeping geographic reference such as the global south. It tells us that we are just as prone to overlook the complexity of relationships within the academe, including hierarchies and com competitiveness, as well as essentialism and nativism, which are what Musavi was warning us about. However, it was this experience that helped us to understand how massive concepts like decolonization need to be subjected to an ongoing reflective process if it is truly to serve the purpose of moving us beyond colonial knowledge formations. So to conclude, the concept of decolonizing has provided an opening for us to individually and collectively articulate a sense of dissatisfaction with being in a westernized academic space. However, Remapping this space theoretically is not enough because there are there were revelations of positionality and intersectionality that needed to be negotiated. This underscores the value of reflexivity in uh, in not just in not just in decolonizing from different disciplines, but also in decolonizing the colonization itself. For now, however, I'll hand over to our other team members who will. Uh, later in the panel, sh further share the kind of knowledge that we did produce during the seminar series. Maraming salamat po at magandang hapon. Mm, sorry, Skilti, am I supposed to take over now? Or... Yes, please, please. Sorry. Oh. So, sorry, my name my name is Daniel. I, I sort of went off the radar for a bit and trying to sign in. My name is Daniel Yo. I'm from Monash University, Malaysia, and I'm very happy to be part of this conference. Okay. Um, I don't know what Silky said, Skilty said, but uh, when I was doing my PhD, post colonialism was the buzzword then, well, nearly 20 years ago. And now, uh, the last few years, you're right, uh, decolonization and decoloniality is now the other buzzword. So I'm very, very keen to follow your uh, experiment in decolonizing decoloniality, if you like. Okay, so, um, okay, the second uh, speaker, part of the Latro panel, actually, yeah, uh, they're throwing a sort of gauntlet to, to, to us uh, in the audience about thinking more deeply about this buzzword, the, uh, if you like, the dissonances, all right, and the consonances. So the second person that will pick up this is Francis Solano and Marjorie Muirong, who will be talking about the way I look at it, the decolonizing discourses of nationalism. Uh, okay, over to you, so, uh, Francis and Marjorie. Thank you so much, Dr. Yo. Let me share my screen. Oops, let's go back at the beginning. So again, a pleasant afternoon to everyone. Um, for this presentation, Francis and myself would be discussing a paper that attempts to decolonize discourses on Filipino nationalism. So the context of this presentation had been um, explained earlier, and Francis and I are really thankful to that seminar series because this paper, this presentation today, many insights really came from that seminar series. Um, I, I guess given that context from a while ago, I would have to say that we're very much looking forward to this. Our entire team is very much looking forward to this presentation because when Francis presented on Southeast Asia during the seminar series and I on the Philippines, I guess the Australian audience did not have much comment about our experiences here in this part of the world. And so we look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions for this paper. For the outline, um, I, as the first presenter, would quickly talk about how nationalism had been deployed conceptually in recent years, then talk, I'll talk about the objectives of this paper, 
before I quickly talk about the sociology of knowledge, which we believe is crucial in understanding um, discourses on Filipino nationalism. And then Francis will talk about some of these attempts to decolonize the idea of nationalism, which is surprisingly already ripe and ready for even more discourses. Um, we conclude by opening up the discussion further uh, toward finding other decolonial alternatives of Filipino nationalism that we hope would be more inclusive and emancipatory. So let me begin with some definitions. Um, over the years, nationalism had been, been defined in many ways. So Ernest Gellner defined it as a political principle that dictates that the state and the nation should be congruent with each other. Um, Leah Greenfeld uh, disagrees with this because to her, it's more of a social consciousness. Because if you look at the etymology of the word nation, nation actually refers to the people. Um, but to others, still, it's not complete to just call it a social consciousness or a discourse because it could also be defined as a project as manifested by social movements and state policies. Further, according to the same author, Calhoun, if you look at it as a, as a discourse and a project, it's some also some sort of an evaluation because you start to see um, nationalism as some sort of an ethical imperative, some sort of standard. Um, from which our actions are um, compared against and what it means to be a good member of a nation. Um, however, you know, the, the many definitions of nationalism indicate for us the need to better understand the concept. And social scientists in recent years had offered intellectual conceptions of nationalism. And I guess most of us are familiar with the, and it's, it's the most, um, a familiar conception, the modernist conception of nation formation led by Ernest Gellner as well as by um, Benedict Anderson. According to them, the nation is a modern construct made possible by contingent historical processes such as industrialization. So for them, national identity is imagined, it is constructed. In response to this idea, um, Anthony Smith, on the other hand, challenged Gellner saying that Perhaps a better conception of nations would be the ethno-symbolist um, notion because we have to think about the fact that nations, modern nations, even if they are modern inventions, still came from ethnic communities. Um, but to us, the question is, you know, in this particular topic, is to whom are Gellner, Anderson, and Smith actually reacting to in their intellectual conceptions, in their, intellect, in their scholarly work? You know, if you look at it, the modernist and ethno-symbolist conceptions are actually social answers, are actually answers to social inquiry about this particular topic. In the experience of the common man, national identity is either an accepted pre-given and hence usually taken for granted, or it is something believed to have existed since time immemorial. So that's the perennialist and the primordialist conceptions or notions of nations. So with this common man notions of nationalism, we think that social inquiry by Filipino scholars on nationalism is not surprising. So I'm sure that most of you would agree with us that our national identities is experienced to be something natural. Parang nandiyan na siya. It's something na, di ba, pag, pag uh, panganak mo, alam mo na Pilipino ka. Indeed, it can be said that at the same time, while we have this... Um, idea na parang natural na meron kang national identity, discourses, intellectual discourses on nationalism also never disappeared in the Philippines ever since the concept has been transplanted from Europe and then bolstered by the Philippine Revolution at the turn of the 20th century. However, there is this, uh, between our experience of national identity today and how we study it, we think that there is a dissonance that needs to be understood better. So this paper attempts to re-examine the idea of nationalism by questioning the colonial vestiges that remain in these discourses and commenting on how these Western-centric ideas, when accepted uncritically, um, contribute to the ill effects of nationalism. So to do so, we present scholarship that have attempted 
to critique discourses on Filipino nationalism in order to foreground their contribution while placing them in the general framework of decolonization. So before I turn you over to Francis, let me quickly explain about the framing we use in our analysis. To achieve these objectives, we take advantage of the scholarly developments in the sociology of knowledge. Um, as it is understood now, sociology of knowledge is the study of the social construction of reality and very important, crucial in this social construction would be socially constituted actors who are in the position to affect the production and circulation and evaluation of knowledge as explained by Andrew earlier. So what we're saying is that um, we argue that there need what we need to do is to try to understand how these actors, including ourselves as scholars, um, construct reality depending on our spatial position in the in the world, you know, in, in scholarly research. And so, according to this classic by Berger and Lockman, um, uh, the social construction of reality published way back in 1966, the construction of reality occurs at two levels: at the objective and at the sub. Objective. There are two levels with the objectification, the institutionalization of meanings, and then in the legitimation. This earlier process set the motion for the idea to be internalized by the people through socialization, which leads to, which leads to identity creation. So given this diagram, it is clear that the reason why discourses on nationalism, as mentioned earlier, is ubiquitous and unquenched, and unquenched but, but also largely avoided. Recognizing that reality is constructed, there are processes involved in how we come to accept things and we need to better understand them. Um, I now turn you over to Francis for these discourses. Um, thank you, uh, Majo. Um, a first step in decolonizing nationalism is decoupling it from its Western provenance. Um, for instance, Partha Chatterjee um, criticized the epistemic privilege of Western scholarship in the study of nationalism. According to him, writings such as that of Gellner disregard the nature of nationalist movements in various contexts, especially in the global south, by readily assuming that industrial, it is industri industrialism which invokes nationalism. In fact, Gellner said that, quote, the necessary philosophizing has already been done, um, end quote. And we need not think about nationalism so much, implying that there is no more need for new ideas, innovation, or debate. Hence, Chatterjee questions why Gellner and other Western scholars see nationalism to be only a very trivial problem in the history of political ideas, when nationalism, in fact, is an imposition from Western from, West, from the West um, to, uh, to non-Western societies. Chatterjee also criticized Anderson, which he sees as being no different from Gellner, specifically on why Anderson conceives third world nationalisms in a modular fashion based on Western epistemology. In other words, the problem with Anderson's treatment of nationalism is that the underlying social order under Western epistemology persists which hinders non-Western scholars from creating their own knowledge. As may be gleaned from the primordialist and perennialist notions of nationalism, the concept may be thought as separate from its historical context. This is particularly problematic in the Philippines, whose experience of colonization shaped its being a nation. John Schumacher, for instance, has argued that the seed of nationalist thought started as a question regarding native Filipino clerics, which eventually shaped the propaganda movement and inspired the revolution. This situates nationalism at the center of anti-colonial struggle from its early inception. The propaganda movement, no matter how seeped with enlightenment ideals, can only conceive of the nation because of the inequalities observed and experienced at home. After this period, in, and in a very tactical move, the US occupation after its so-called pacification of the islands transformed the idea into a civic nationalism. According to Mujares, the period of Americanization was also in fact a period of Filipinization, and it was in the first half of the 20th century 
more than at any other time that the sense and sentiment of being Filipino was formed. The U.S. colonizers did this through policies that seemed to promote Filipino leadership and self-government, tokenistic symbols and celebrations that put nationalism to everyday discourse, and even support for intellectual production. Many of these are inherited today from the nationalist image of the Barong Tagalog and Jose Rizal to the ideals of liberal democracy uh, and are therefore cemented to the consciousness of Filipinos. The Japanese um, attempted to remold the Western leanings of nationalisms in the lines of pan-Asian ideals, but um, this was cut short at the end of the war. Lastly, there had been attempts to co-opt the ideals of nationalism for political ends. The important point here is that these historical contingencies need to be highlighted in any study of Philippine nationalism because they also foreground how nationalism may have carried over colonialist intentions and vestiges of state authoritarianism. A direct effect of an ahistorical understanding of nationalism is its misalignment with present day Filipino realities. For instance, Roman Coraming notes that although there are indigenous perspectives on knowledge production in the Philippines that attempt to offset Western centric epistemologies, he questions whether the agenda set by progressive scholars um, coincide um, with what is advantageous for marginalized people. He laments that these efforts may have diverted our attention away from the real problems of contemporary society, such as oppression and marginalization and the persistence of patron clientelist politics. Worse is that these same projects may be used by the state for self-serving political purposes. A good example here is the Tadhana project, where an an indigenous nationalism was constructed as a propaganda for Marcos's Bagong Lipunan. Lisandro Claudio also argues that nationalist historiography during Marcos's time, while issuing critiques against colonialism and neocolonialism, tends to elide class difference. Another problem is privileging national cultural identity over regional differences. Because institutions based in the capital are clearly at an advantage, it, it was only recently that local histories and contexts are given attention, which aggravates the problem of an already essentialist concept of the nation. Trevor Hogan um, explains that Filipino nationalism has been romanticized through the persistence of perennialist conception of Filipino nationalism. Um, there is the Philippine Revolution romanticized to be a revolution of heroes with the implication that Filip the Filipino people are heroic. In this sense, there is much hero worshiping in Philippine historiography. Uh, and Jose Rizal, for example, is conceived not only as the first Filipino, but also as a Jesus figure. During the Marcos regime, they used nationalism to maintain power um, and smokescreen their corruption. Um, by becoming grand, grand patrons of Filipino culture. In this case, we need to decolonize um, Filipino nationalisms, and it is good that it has started already with various Filipino scholars. To decolonize Philippine nationalism, we need to reveal to ourselves the colonial vestiges of our Filipino nationalism. In other words, um, Hogan suggests that we avoid perennialist and um, primordialist conceptions of Filipino identity. That means accepting that we are yet to define ourselves free from colonial impositions. Um, Hogan suggests to see a reality of having contending nationalisms as an alternative modernity, rather than seeing ourselves as a developing nation and the path toward modernization. Uh, in conclusion, clearly decolonization is an active and ongoing project since the after effects of colonization cast long shadows. 
re-examining nationalism through a decolonial lens is necessary, especially for prevailing, um, especially because prevailing assumption, because of prevailing assumptions that limit its promise um, for Filipinos. Decolonization comes in many forms and as shown in the literature that we presented also leads to various traje trajectories. And again, um, we would like to open up the discussion to possible and present efforts toward this end. Um, thank, thank you very much. Uh, and here is our bibliography. Hey, thank you, Francis and Madhuri. Very interesting. Uh, probably open up a kind of worms for us to munch on a little on. Um, so last but not least, we're going to pleasure and sex work. Uh, and this could be quite potentially interesting to deal with how do you find the colonial in this kind of research. So last but not least, uh, who is it? Nikos Dakanai. Yes. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Yo. Um, Magandang hapon, uh, everyone. I would like to begin my presentation by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm based in the Bundura campus of La Trobe University, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I would like to pay my respects to their past, present, and emerging leaders. I thank them for their generous hospitality and acknowledge that they have never ceded sovereignty. I would also like to pay my respects and acknowledge the indigenous traditional owners and first people of all the places that you're listening from. The title of my presentation is Bangkok's Boys of Pleasure, Sex Work Research Using the Colonial Research Methods. I will be reading my presentation. So there is a growing interest in the colonial research methods, a series of webinars, on these organized by, by the University of Southampton was just recently held. The lecture by the colonial scholar, Professor Walter Mignolo last November 23, had more than 600 attendees across the globe. If there is anything to go by this development, it is that the colonial frameworks, methodologies, and practices are gaining traction in and outside the academe. My initiation into the, the colonial movement was through the webinar series that I co-organized with my Filipino colleagues in this panel. Allow me to thank my colleagues for the courage that we all took when we plunged ourselves um, into this dizzying and still evolving movement. The webinar series we organize have widened my intellectual horizon and have shaped my research in fundamental ways. The colonial methodologies have been around for some time now. Post-colonial indigenous and feminist scholarship and even the now vogue scholarship on post-human or more than human ontology has been championing them in their attempts to create alternative forms of knowledge systems and epistemes beyond Western models or beyond the regimes of social science canons, which they argue to have colonial vestiges. They argue that the colonial methodologies privilege reflexivity as an ethical and moral practice and view knowledge as co-constitutive co -constitutive of the research of the research encounter and the research process. This view of knowledge destabilizes not just the inherent and equal power relationship between the researcher and the researched, but also the colonial geopolitics of academia, where according to Professor Vinita Sinha, and I quote, the global South is seen as supplier of data and the global North as theories, end of quote. For this presentation, I provide an account of the ethical challenges I faced in interviewing migrant male sex workers for my PhD research and how I was able to address these challenges by employing principles of parity and reciprocity, particularly emotional reciprocity and reciprocal questioning, which I source from feminist, queer, and women of color scholarship on sex work. So similar to, to the two uh, previous presentations, I will exercise uh, reflexivity and reflect on what the colonial research methods can offer public health research on sex work. So my PhD research is about migrant male sex workers in Thailand. I'm doing it under the School of Psychology and Public Health. I focus on young men who come from Thailand's neighboring countries in Southeast Asia. They cross the poorest Thai borders, get plugged in the country's informal labor sector, and somehow end up participating in the country's multi-billion dollar sex tourism industry. I am interested in understanding the risk environment of these migrant male sex workers and how they are living or inhabiting this environment. 
I conceptualize the risk environment, not just in relation to HIV, but in relation to uncertainty and insecurity more broadly. Since sex work for the most part constitutes the peddling and commoditizing of pleasure, the performing and practicing of it, the need to be able to experience it to finish a sexual economic transaction, I am interested in how migrant male sex, work sex workers experience, understand, negotiate, and risk manage pleasure within a context of an insecure environment. Well, the geographical focus of my study is Thailand, because of COVID-19 travel, travel restrictions, the research is taking place online at the moment, with me based in Melbourne and with my research participants based in Bangkok and Pattaya. I'm conducting the interviews using LINE application, a cross-platform mobile messaging app for smartphones. The online environment has made establishing rapport challenging since the technologically mediated interaction creates an illusion of distance. This is despite my knowledge of and familiarity with the pleasure industry in Thailand, having lived there since 2008 and being friends with several uh, male sex workers. To overcome this, I employed emotional reciprocity, a decolonial research method championed by feminist scholarship on sex work. This method involves the ethical practice in which the researcher reciprocates the emotions that the research participant is exhibiting during an interview a way for the researcher to empathize and relate with the participant by sharing similar or approximate personal experiences. For my part, I also shared stories about myself as a gay person and difficulties during COVID-19, such as living alone in Melbourne and not being able to see my partner or visit my mother back home. This allowed me to establish some form of connection. I found that finding emotional, uh, emotional affiliations with migrant sex workers and sharing my own stories helped to build trust and connection and develop rapport. But while I initially employed uh, emotional reciprocity as a tactic to develop rapport in order to extract better data, I do not view it that way anymore. The young men I am having conversations with are going through the most devastating effects of this pandemic with the loss of their livelihood and without income for more than a year now. I now view emotional reciprocity and sharing of stories of difficult experiences during COVID-19 as a way of mutually making sense of these difficult times. Another challenge in data collection that I face concerns sexualization of conversations with migrant male sex workers. There were many episodes of flirting and flirtatious bantering during the interviews. Participants were curious about me and asked me personal questions. One participant, for instance, insisted that for every question I asked him, he should ask the question back. Some participants asked me about my sexual experiences and tried to verify the information about my sexual preferences, which they had received from common friends. Others share their sexy photos and asked me to share mine. <clears throat> During interviews, some of them did not have their shirt on, while others were just in their underwear. There was one occasion where a participant called me while well, he was fully naked and taking a shower. And some positioned their phones so that their thighs or their crotch area were foregrounded in the camera while they spoke with me. The relationship between me and my participants did not also end after the interview as some of them continued to chat with me on line app. There was an expectation from them for the relationship to continue. In all of this, I found myself constantly deliberating on how to balance maintaining professional and personal boundaries, while at the same time being reflexive of the, of the dynamics of the interview. I found myself constantly reflecting on issues of boundaries, positionality, and the entanglement of both my professional and personal identities as I interacted with migrant male sex workers. To overcome this dilemma, I employed reciprocal questioning in which I allowed migrant male sex workers to also ask me question, questions where I also shared information about my sexuality and also played sexualization when I knew it was safe. Reciprocal question, uh, questioning proved to be helpful as it made my participants talk more. Flirting has made me recognize the inherent power asymmetry between the researcher and the research and how this can change when positionalities shift and become more fluid in a, flirt in a flirtatious episode. So what is the value of adopting the colonial research methods in a public health research about migrant male sex workers? According to Tuhi Weiss myth, colonialism is implicated in how social science disciplines conduct research. 
Social science research methods are not neutral since they are grounded in colonialism and in unproblematized assumptions about who should be observing and producing knowledge and who should be observed or be providing the data needed to produce knowledge. In his book, Epidemic of Illusions on the Coloniality of Global Public Health, medical anthropologist Eugene Richardson argues that global public health is an apparatus of coloniality. This is because its subdiscipline of epidemiology and epidemiology's methods and ideologies has an imperialistic posture that renders its causation models of diseases as truths. These causation models factor race and gender variables that when applied in the global south suggest that they have a direct correlation to vulnerability to certain diseases. Epidemiology has also historically viewed male sex workers as either psychopathological or as vectors of disease. It understands male sex workers' risk to HIV using biomedical approaches to health. These approaches use rational decision-making and reasoned action theories that presuppose that a rational individual who has knowledge about HIV will practice safe sex, and therefore a sex worker who doesn't practice safe sex is not a rational human being. According to health sociologist Tim Rhodes, this kind of thinking presumes that risk taking is calculative and context free. These dominant paradigms are how ma male sex workers are understood in health sciences today. And this monopoly of truth disregards the structures of inequality that in the global south are caused by colonization and which shape certain populations' vulner vulnerability to certain diseases. Specifically, it disregards distal factors such as social and political structures or the social, political, and economic reasons that create or increase sex workers' risk to HIV. Public health is also a discipline that perpetuates coloniality because it participates in what Professor Raven Connell calls, and I quote, the global economy of knowledge and the global division of labor, in which the global south is where data is collected and the global north is where analysis and theorizing of data is made by the elite knowledge institutions. The global south is where HIV is prevalent amongst the so-called key population of sex workers, drug users, gay men who have sex with men, gay men and men of sex with men, categorized and named and defined by experts from the global north, where UNAIDS, the World Health Organizations, and other international policy-making bodies are located, and where public health prescriptions for, the, for, this, mar for this key and um, quote-unquote marginalized populations are made. This is the hegemony of knowledge in public health. This was underscored in yesterday's roundtable discussion by the Ogadal elders when Professor Mike Tan argued how prescriptive government public health measures during the COVID pandemic were not appropriate to the structural conditions in the Philippines, characterized by highly condensed metropolis, the general lack of sanitation, and the disregard for the needs of the elderly. And since public health is an objectivist, so objectivist social science where research is usually framed in positivist paradigm, it is obsessed with data not being tainted by the researcher's background or any other interaction between the researcher and the research participant beyond the interview setup. In calls to decolonize public health research on sex work, scholars are calling for the unpacking of terms sex work and sex workers. Sexual health research, who are the agents of change, need to be invested in acknowledging and breaking away from what Tuhi, Tuhi Y. Smith calls, and I quote, colonial inheritance and continuing colonial imprint of conceptual frameworks and politics, end of quote. Public health researchers need to acknowledge how in an interview setup or a participant observation session, asking question or doing the observing is always a position of power. The second step is for this binary and power asymmetry between the interviewer and the interviewed, as well as between the observer and the observed to be overturned. And this, is, and this can be done through reciprocity. Reciprocity is a form of parity which Professor Vinita Sinha describes, and I quote, a sharing of stories and experiences in a mutual back and forth conversations, end of quote. According to Tuhi White Smith, parity is important in sexual health research because it empowers the individuals and communities that are being studied. Par parity acknowledges and works within the cultural framework that is in play when we do interviews or participant observation. Parity shifts the paradigm of knowledge production as something that is not the sole product of a public health researcher collecting data, but a co-constructed and co-constituted knowledge born out of the relationship developed when the researcher and the research um, subject interact. To quote Professor Smith, 
the researcher endeavors become creative practices in building knowledge together between the researcher and the research subject, end of quote. Public health can learn from the colonial and feminist approach to sex work research through more inclusive methods that are sensitive to power relations and how positionality and the biography of the researcher, including their sexuality, affect relations with participants, as well as how knowledge is contingent on this dialogical relationship. In my own study of migrant male sex workers in Thailand, by removing the binary of interviewer interviewed that, ha- that I had initially imposed in my interaction with migrant male sex workers and adopting the colonial researchers principles of parity, I was able to engage in playful fr- flirtatious bantering with my participants and share my own stories as was culturally expected of me asking private information from my interlocutors. I also continued communication after the interview and the friendly relationship that I was able to build with the men I've interviewed has led me to better understand the context of their responses to my uh, interview questions. But more than this, the whole exercise of parity has allowed me to gain a deeper understanding of the co-construction of knowledge. It has allowed me to reframe the the, the knowledge that is being produced in my PhD research project as not just a product of my own work, gathering data and analyzing in my test, but a co-production between myself and the migrant male sex workers. The dynamics in my relationship with them and my conversations with them, which included flirting, creates a kind of knowledge that is a situated knowledge, one that takes place within a social context whereby my and my participants' sexualities shape the interview process, the questions that are asked, the responses that are elicited, and the data that that is generated in the process. Embracing parity has allowed me to delink, in the words of Professor Walter Mignolo, with all co-productions and co-constitutions of relations of power, including the system of knowledge and product system of knowledge production and public health research on sex work that is Euro-North centric and through which coloniality pervades. According to Esteval Fernandez and Barbara Arisi, research that employs the colonial frameworks and methodologies does not mean denying or disavowing European scientific way of thinking, but rather moving its axis of understanding and broadening our ways of thinking by considering, and I quote, production, practices, theories, experiences, concepts, and thoughts produced in the borders, end of quote. Employing the colonial and feminist critical methodology in sexual health research will also necessitate adopting an interpretivist paradigm. It was therefore necessary for me to view migrant male sex workers through the lens of intersectionality, a decolonial framework developed by black feminist scholars, which understands individuals who are situated at the intersections of multiple domains of oppression and marginality. Through this lens, I'm able to understand migrant male sex workers in their multiple intersecting identities as sex workers, men who use drugs, migrants, and gay. Proponents of intersectionality argue that you cannot understand an individual's identities or categories separate from each other. These identities or categories shape each other. An intersectional approach to sexual health research resists heter- heteropatriarchy and heteronormative archetypes, such as the categorizing of certain populations, which is prevalent in public health research. Intersectionality not only privileges research of non-normative genders and sexualities, but also the intersections of sexual health with the individual's economic, social, and political conditions. While the decolonial methods are still exercised and produced in the borders or the interstitial zones, according to Fernandez and Arisi, they're resilient and beautifully solidifying through coalition and collaboration. For instance, many collaborative research projects by scholars studying uh, by scholars studying, uh, doing work on uh, uh, with sex workers are using sex uh, are using queer theory that is informed by the colonial perspective, conscious of the coloniality of race and gender in post-colonial settings where individuals live. In the process, these scholars destabilize and trench hierarchies within the academia as well as dominant queer theorizing that is race amishak and colonial amishak. Moreover. Medical anthropologists such as Eugene Richardson, Paul Farmer, Arthur Kleiman, if, and if I may add Michael Pan, are critiquing epidemiology's coloniality and hegemony of knowledge production. In my attempt to address the hegemony of power imbalance in an interview setup with migrant male sex workers in the 
in the Asia Pacific that is often unproblematized in public health research through my adoption of principles of parity. I want to believe that I am contributing in the words of queer feminist and the colonial scholar Maria Logones in advancing new geopolitics of knowledge. Thank you, maraming salamat sa pakikinig. Okay, thank you, Nikos, maraming salamat for a very full and very impassioned uh, take on decolonial methods, yeah, research methods. So on my watch, it's 158 here. Can, can we spotlight all the panelists, uh, Aida? And I was told by Skilty to finish by 225 so that we can uh, slowly move into book launch, yeah? All right, so I want, of course, uh, I want to summarize, but just to give people time to brew up the questions and they will put it in the chat. Okay, so a lot of things pop on my mind, but I can't articulate all them in a beautiful manner, but things like, let's move in backwards fashion, right? So, um, yeah, so I think that the supposedly the colonial methods or the, the colonizing methods is a very extraction with this extractionist methodology, right? As by this guy, D'Souza Santos was talking about, uh, Balventura. And it is based on essentially uh, Western enlightenment uh, elevation of the reason, right? Uh, all of us are rational beings. Uh, uh, and therefore, when we do research, we're supposed to remove our emotion, our heart. In it. So I think one of the decolonizing methods, and which of course championed by you know, Linda Smith and the indigenous peoples especially, is to bring back the heart uh, and even religion and spirituality into our, well, frame. <laughs> Right, it's not just the mind. It's, it's we are all embodied beings with you no know, belief in spirits and, and so on and so forth. Right. So in Nikos' case, it is a sexual being. Right. Uh, all of us are also sexual beings um, in, in, in our in whatever configuration. And I think he offers a very personal and and yet a very quote unquote scientific approach to decolonizing method by bringing in our own sexualities uh, and sharing in reciprocal reciprocal questioning and of course the importance of flirting right in in classic anthropology we have this term called faking friendships in order to extract data so i think all of us are guilty in some way or the other of faking friendships with our informants yeah and then we don't really carry on with that relationship after you know after we leave the field site or and so on and so forth okay nationalism yeah, so uh, I think that, that our two friends have thought of talk about the uh, sort of problematized nationalism, um, but I also, I also remember work about the nation, right? What, what constitutes the nation? And I think it was Marjorie who said that the nation in the Latin original meaning is to, it actually means peoples. So even when I was doing work on the Philippines, uh, which is the Northern Philippines, Cordillera, uh, when I was looking at the people, the, 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 the description of the people that used to go to build the Benguet Road, right? The zigzag road, they were all called nations, right? Uh, you know, the Chinese people was a nation and so on and so forth. And I was a bit, you know, um, puzzled by that, all right? Then I realized that, oh, I've taken for granted this notion of the nation state, all right? Which is a particular geo body, all right? Uh, imag uh, imagined into being and which also requires a politics of forgetting, forgetting your so-called quote unquote tribal ties, your local ties and reimagining a bigger geo body. Uh, which of course is now in the world of the United Nations, is the nation state with clear boundaries and borders and the need of the very importance of passports and visas, right? Uh, certification of your legitimacy as a citizen of that country or non-citizen. So again, uh, we're back to this so-called identity issue about what constitutes nation, what is the nation, who is the nation, and how big is this nation, all right? Where does it, end, uh, where does it end actually? All right, the last, the first one is, uh, of course, uh, yeah, uh, Andrew and Anna was basically laying the framework of this whole project of decolonizing uh, the academy, I suppose, in where you are pl uh, placed, Latro. So when I was sort of introduced to this just a year ago, right, when I was doing some kind of early work, and then I realized there's one in Liverpool, there's one in the university in the Philippines, there's a local studies network on Facebook, and now I realize there's another one in Latro. So it is obviously a bus word or a bandwagon of sorts. And when things get become so inflated, there's a uh, uh, danger of it becoming in Deridian terms, an empty signifier, when you can park anything under it and that claims that you're doing some radical work. Yeah. So it is important and it is uh, very useful that you have in, in this particular presentation, um, presented your own, if you like, puzzles, your own uh, anxiety, and your own discoveries about how to go about navigating this new uh, 
this new brave new world, right? Uh, and and not lapsing into the old ways, uh, not totally getting rid of it because we don't have completely a new paradigm yet. But you know, uh, a, a, a careful filtering of of the colonial old ways and doing something more equitable and more just and sustainable. All right. With that, I'm going to open up. Uh, to the floor. So you can either write in the chat box, and which I see already, and put up your hands. So let me open my chat box. I think my internet is getting a bit. All I see is a white screen. White slowly coming up. Hey guys, I can't see anything in my chat box. When I open up, I see a white screen. So can you, anybody, can you read from your side, the chat box? Is there a question directed at you? Hmm? Seeing no questions on the chat box as of now. Oh yeah, my, some, something is weird. I think there's some trollers out there trying to destroy this project. <laughs> Daniel, uh, there are no questions, but you can probably ask them to. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. So white half a white screen, and I don't see anything else. Okay, Joe. Since you you articulate when you want to ask a question. No, yeah, probably we can have a sort of round table discussion among the uh, presenters. Oh yeah, here. Okay, I see one now from Ellie. For Francis and Marjorie, may I know if you have come across the works of some Filipino? And that's all I can read in my chat box. Ellie, why don't you unmute yourself and ask the question, Ellie? Yeah, yeah, I can read it. I can read it for you. No, but I need my glasses. Okay, for a minute. Okay, okay I, I can read it. Okay. Asuka, please, please. May I know if you have come across the works of some Filipino scholars, one of whom I can think of right now is Zio Salazar. Salazar and some scholars have forwarded the idea of the huge divide between the two major directions of nation making during the late 1800s. According to these scholars, Filipino intellectuals' idea of the nation uh, to construct the Philippines is derived mainly from the European tradition of nation building. On the other hand, another group, mainly from the grassroots, were more into the tradition of the Ili or the Bayan. Nation and Bayan, according to these scholars, wait, uh, I just scroll. <laughs> Okay, Nacion, I'll continue, can I? Okay. The, I'll continue the reading. No? Yes. Nacion and Bayan, according to these scholars, no, are two different strategies of decolonizing movements in the Philippines during the period. Your comment on this, please, if you have encountered this discourse in your current work. Um, thank I'm just, you. I, I, I'm, just like, I, I'm just interested if you have encountered this in your yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, um, Ellie, for the for the um, in fact a very important question. Um, in the work of Romel Kuroming, in fact, it was um, Pantayong Pananaw is one of the um, pro, uh, one of the sort of progressive um, movements that he criticizes, um, and he says that. Um, again, so, sometimes these these uh, movements. Number one, sometimes they remain only in the academia, and they are misaligned with what what's happening in Filipino reality. So, for example, uh, so Kuroming, um, for example, is interested. How are these um, movements being translated to? say the everyday lives of of um filipinos um and i think uh, I, I and i sort of agree with that kind of um um critique um for example in this conference um we can we can debate on and on right um regarding theories of nationalisms discourses in in our presentation we um in fact it's just um what uh, a review of literature um, of, of uh, um, scholars that are existing. Again, we are opening up the discussion, but of course, at the back of my mind, of our mind, um, and Major probably can um, talk a little about this more later. Um, how, um, how do we um, 
go beyond say the walls of the academia of, of conferences um, and I'm probably in, in our discussions in, in the panel I'm, I'm, um, Anna for example had been um, active for quite some time with some um, work beyond beyond academia and I think that that would be a promising um, venue um, to bring discussions um, like this um, um, that's um, the thing that just comes to my mind right now. Um. Thank you. Maybe, thank you, Francis. Maybe we can add a bit to that. Um, I think uh, this differentiation between the Nation and then Bayan um, is parallel with the modernist conception versus the ethno-symbolist conception of nation, wherein the latter says you have to also look at um, ethnic communities as the source of the formation of nations, unlike what Gellner and Anderson pushes for, that they are modern inventions or imaginations. And well, not, one thing that I did not say um, for in our presentation um, a while ago is my, my, my own thesis with Latrobe is focused on the relationship between nationalism and national identity and um, economic um, development, which I remember Andrew mentioned. So personally, in terms of comment on this particular differentiation, uh, perhaps we have to start rethinking, not just the Philippines, but other people, other communities in the global South. We have to start thinking about what it means to be a nation, what it means to modernize, what it means to develop, because we've been following with the imposition of Western society about what it means to progress, what it means to be a nation, what it means to be developed. We haven't really thought about that. Um, and maybe that's what I, we hope to contribute on those discourses as well in the future. Thank you very much for the, for the question. Uh, Andrew, do you want to come in? I saw you nodding a bit. Oh, well, um, I, I was agreeing with um, what Francis and Majo have been talking about with regard to this question of the nation and the different ways in which people have tried to sort of go beyond the Western modern idea of, of the nation. Um, um, uh, I'm semi-familiar with Salazar's work, but not, but not uh, overtly so. Um, in many ways, though, I do find it exciting that there are grassroots attempts to rethink the idea of nationhood. My, um, some of the exposure, some of the ideas that I've been exposed to include someone like um, Latin American scholar Jesus Martin Barbero, who talks about what he calls the discontinuity between nation and state, um, which leads to a certain, uh, a certain difference between um, colonial states in Latin America, um, uh, uh, sorry, post-colonial states in Latin America, a difference from the Western world, but not a difference because of underdevelopment, but simply a different kind of development, one that modernism, uh, sorry, one that modernity cannot really account for. Yeah, Ali, want to Can I have a follow up? Yeah, I think that's precisely the point of this particular argument. I'm not saying I completely subscribe to this argument forwarded by Zeus. No? Uh, but what I really find interesting here is what you have mentioned, no? The, the, the attempt of scholars to identify ethnic um, characterizations or ethnicity's way of providing an idea of what it means to be a, a group, no? uh, in the terms like, for instance, Ely, which is, according to the scholars, uh, as practiced completely different from the idea of the European tradition of Nathion, uh, which, is, which was forwarded or which was being forwarded by, by the intellectuals of the period. No? So, siguro, my, 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 my point here right now is, um, of course, that is only one of several aspects of the Pantayong Pananaw. Of course, there are a huge, a huge set of limits in that concern, and I agree perhaps with your position on that. No? But there is this very important point no? in one of the works of Salazar about the, for me, an identification of the term Ili to describe early settlements no? in the Philippines. Uh, Ili, not as a term, it is a category, we are now providing that, but really as lived during that period by those settlers or by those communities in areas either uh, colonized or not colonized by, by, by other forces. No? So, gusto ko lang, well, baka lang kasi this is a particular moment, 
that uh, that you may also find interested uh, interesting to explore in your in your reevaluation of various movements no? uh, in in local communities of how they have attempted to to describe these communities not necessarily applicable in current conditions but in, in situations uh, in which these communities were, were were situated during the period and perhaps draw some insights on how such things are are explored somewhere else, not necessarily in the Philippines, but perhaps in some areas of the world. Go on lang naman. Uh, uh, just recommending, uh, not really not really suggesting that you believe in this principle, but just asking if you, if uh, just for you to reconsider some of these uh, ideas which are already in the literature. Baka lang naman, because I, I didn't see this in the presentation. Baka lang naman makatulong. Okay. Pero kung... You can disregard the, the, the ideas provided eventually, at least. No? Hey, thank you, Ali. Uh, thank you, Ali. Uh, any other questions? I don't see. Oh, and I want to come in. Yeah. Dagdagan ko lang yung context ni ano, Sir LD. Um, my position now is um, transnational. So, galing din ako sa mga movements in, when I was in the Philippines, um, working towards to assist. Um, um, marginal groups. Yeah. Kaya lang nung nag-relocate na ako sa Australia, I just, it allowed me the perspective of looking at nation building um, in a more critical sense because I could see two contexts. Sa atin kasi, we are the colonized people and we are trying to establish nationhood in spite of that colonial background. Dito naman, sa Australia, ang context ng nationalism is coming from um, a majority population, which is actually the colonizer. So baliktad. So the uses of the, the term and the concept colo uh, nationhood um, are quite, um, not binary, but very different in, in perspective. So yung sa atin, how do we, how do we rebuild from this, um, uh, the scars of colonialism? How do we create nation and become a part of the world of nations? So Australia naman, how do we um, how do we continue with our with our um, status as a nation while uh, um, while ad addressing the injustices that we have done to the indigenous people of Australia? So interesting, because once you you shift perspective, as um, as was mentioned earlier, ibang iba yung nakikita mong context ng decolonization. So you could have the same uh, the same um, uh, noble motives, but in, from a very different, you know, very different uh, motivation. So a very interesting, shot. Pero at the same time, the passion is there. The the desire to change things for the better is there. But umiiba lang yung ano yung pinanggagalingan. Yeah, I really look forward to this work. Pwede magbahagi. Maraming, uh, okay, so we have to move on a little bit. Uh, I know I recognize the hand of Ufasio okay. Abaya. Oh, Dr. Yo, can I say something Sorry, want, with regard to, to nationalism? Okay. All right. Also, I remember then when we had this um, the, the 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 seminar on nationalism, we had a reactor who was a post-colonial scholar. I forget his name, Carlos Moreo, and he mentioned ang ang response niya ay pwede nating imagine ang nationalism using the concept of yung pluriversality na na nanggaling kay uh, the colonial scholar Walter Mignolo na from the from Walter Mignolo naman ang sabi niya galing naman ito sa uh, sa arms struggle ng mga zapatistas yung uh, imagining a different kind of a uh, uh, political organization so parang imagining a world in which, in which many worlds coexist Mas radical lang, mas radical lang view ang, ang take ni, ni Professor Moreo sa reimagining nationalism. Okay, I recognize the hand of Ifrasio Abaya, sir. Yeah, Good yeah, I'd like to uh, address my question to uh, Nikos Dakanai. And um, it has something to do with uh, the the idea that the writing process is part and parcel of that whole knowledge production, right? And I'm curious as to how you, how this will play out in your research, uh, especially if you advocate for co-production as well as this principle of reciprocity. I mean, how, I'm trying to imagine how you would 
how you would conduct that. Thank you. Well, maraming salamat sa tanong, Sir Fras. Ang hirap naman ang tanong ninyo. I will ano, attempt to respond to it. Um, I think yung idea ng co-constitution, co-constitution o co-production ng knowledge ay nanggagaling sa uh, research paradigm na interpretivism tas, uh, uh, in reaction to the positivist paradigm na kung saan ang research ay uh, na objective social science where the researcher is the one formulating the research question, asking the, uh, uh, in, get, gathering data and analyzing and providing recommendations. Um, yung principle of uh, yung idea ng co-constitution is something in which it it um it it views knowledge as a situated knowledge tama ba na yung knowledge ay resulta ng interaction or ng process yung gan- so i think doon nanggagaling idea ng uh, uh, knowledge is a uh, um is a situated knowledge situated and partial nature of our understanding of the others. We're, for example, we're uh, trying to uh, uh, discover this environment of the migrant male sex workers in Thailand. Yung, the way I formulate the research questions and yung in research, uh, yung mga tanong na uh, binabado ko sa, uh, sa research participants, yung mga sagot nila, ang, ang interpretivist paradigm, ang tingin nila dito ay eh, ang data na nakukuha mo mula dito sa sa interaction na to ay situated data and partial it cannot be absolute and cannot be you cannot say that this is the real because this in, it is how you interpret and this is a product of a specific kind of interaction which is why yung sexuality ng ng ng, inter, ng interviewer or, or ng biography niya importante kasi nagre-reflect din ng kausap mo sa sa isang conversation uh, yung sagot niya ay nagre-reflect kung anong tingin niya sa'yo bilang halimbawa isang Pilipina or sabihin, isang bakla din katulad niya or isang possible uh, customer siguro malapit matapos ang interview set up uh, matapos ang interview it can be a pos- uh, I can um, so I think I think that's that that is where uh, this uh, co-constitution or co-production of knowledge is, is situated but there are also indigenous methodologies where no may specific Uh, 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 um, a conscious effort to involve the research participants right in the in the writing in the formulation of the research questions in the conducting the research and um, even in finding res- res- um, like recommendations sa mga research questions yung participatory action research na sina champion ng mga um, community or uh, community organizations Uh, yung yung philosophy ni Friday. Uh, I hope na sagot kay sagot din. No, I think I think I think yung act, what I'm driving at is that whole process of writing. You know, it's it, a different context altogether, and it's, it's such oh. a big challenge, di ba? Ni yeah. Ko. I mean, uh, if if writing uh, is that whole practice, it's mediated kasi yun. Eh. And yes. to, what extent, to what extent are your participants able to participate, you know, that, that participate? In the rising. So, kaya nga, I'm trying to, it's a difficult situation, but uh, you don't it's, have to kind of deal with that now. But I'm, I'm just, okay, yeah. if I were to conduct that research, I mean, uh, I will have certain dilemmas because yes. writing is a different phase altogether. I and think, I, mm, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, not just writing, even the field work, even the whole research endeavor is an intensely personal. And but you're gathering data and you're relating with people. And I think um, what uh, the colonial scholars are advocating, they're advocating for parang constant reflexivity. You're always reflecting on the ethical dilemmas, on how the, the knowledge was created, ano ba yung situation, and uh, yung ethical dilemmas between the research and the research participant, yung positionality ng researcher, yung biography niya, and how that is all affecting. So I think, I don't know, baka yung contra- constant ref- uh, reflexivity. Sa so, specific project ko, yung ipoproduce kong report, may condensed version at ibibig at uh, may refer, may, ang tawag dito? May uh, ipepresent ko sa, sa, sa mga participants ko tapos tatanungin ko, do they 
na agree ka ba sa gantong interpretation ko sa sa iyong sinabi may may mga ibang participants na ayaw na nilang matanggap kung ano yung yung naisulat ko pero may may ibang humihingi so nasa uh, nasa ano nga yun informed consent ko at tinatanong ko sila kung gusto mo makahingi ng uh, draft copy ng so siguro doon uh, sir Fras uh, papasok yeah, yung yeah. yung uh, uh, um, interactive co-constitution co-production of knowledge of knowledge in the whole in uh, research uh, um, process yeah, and I think it's yeah thank you I, I think that the particular approach would probably address that issue of co-production because they're able to intervene you know intervene yeah yes diba? thank you Nico Maraming salamat sir Fras Okay, uh, I know Joe has put up a hand, but on my clock, it's already 2.23, and I'm supposed to stop this at 2.25. So maybe you can take this offline, yeah, because uh, there, there's a book launch going on. So uh, thank you very much, panels. I think uh, we have achieved the ends. Uh, you have achieved your objective by setting up this panel, and I think you'll stir up a hornet's nest, or at least give us food for thought, and maybe subsequent UGAT workshops, smaller workshops with Uh, uh, postgraduate students or even with lecturers, professors about research methodology, about the, the linking, the uh, rethinking uh, our so-called academic jargons and academic te- uh, terminologies and their genealogies of uh, con- uh, concepts. Yeah. So may I have that certificate? I'm supposed to apply the... Yeah. So we don't do really do this in Malaysia. So this is new for me. It was very interesting. Can you enlarge a little bit? Yeah. So Undayang Pang Akhamtao, otherwise the Anthropological Association of the Philippines, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, uh, the Anthropological and Sociological Initiative of Ateneo Institute of Philippine Culture present this certificate of appreciation to the following: Andrew T, Ana Torres Ablit, Marjorie S Muirong, Francis C Solano. And Nikos Dakanai for uh, their panel presentations on which is this interdisciplinary responses to decolonial thinking. Thank you very much for a very provocative uh, panel, and we hope that you will uh, continue on in this kind of work and inspire a younger generation to uh, to, put, to to forge new pathways into decolonial knowledge and methodologies. Thank you, everyone. Let's give them a virtual clap. Thank you, Dr. Yeo, for moderating. Uh, we catch up later. Yeah. Uh, we need to have a short uh, photo taking. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, one more thing. Yeah, Again, this is quite new to me. <laughs> right. So let's do the panel speakers first. Cameras on. Uh, Aida. Is... Okay, uh, cameras on. Smile on. Oh, hold on, more cameras on. All right. One, two, three, and okay. Okay, may I invite everybody to switch on the cameras just for uh, remembrance of this very historic moment? All right, um, everybody, smile on three. One, two. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So thank you for moderating, Doctor Yo. Uh, yeah, let's hope to talk some more. Monash and Latrop get together. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Doctor sure. Yo. Thank, thank you, you Doctor. Thanks to everyone. Thank yeah. you. Okay, stay on to this uh, channel if you want to continue on with the book launch. This is this uh, Zoom link. Yeah. Book launch. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank Bye-bye. You. Galing, galing. Thank you. Salamat, Sir Eli. Salamat, po, Sir Eli. Thank you, thank you.